I'm on a different computer tonight, so I hope you guys can hear me okay. And it's good to be with you all. I've been gone for a few weeks and uh, I'm gonna turn the gallery view so I can see you. Hi. All right, good. How have you been? Have you been doing well, safe and healthy? Good. All right. Well, um, really the only announcement I have is that I've got a course coming up that starts on Sunday for 21 Taras. So it's really like the main teaching I'm doing all year. It's a year long immersion every other Sunday. And um, it's two hours on Sunday morning, nine to 11 a.m. And each class we dive into one Tara. So we'll go from one to 21. It's in three parts. So if you don't know if you can do the whole year, you're welcome to sign up for a, a third and then the next third if you want and so on. That's at taramandala.org. I don't know, Mace, could you type that in? I didn't have time to pull up that link, but maybe you could just type in the Tara Mandala website. Uh, I really love that the work. I'm doing a book on, on the 21 Taras and we're not just talking about kind of like old medieval, you know, tantric deities. We're also talking about real life women who embody those qualities of each of the Taras and how to bring those about within our own life and how to engage ourselves, you know, and bring about what's called the Trinle or the enlightened activities of each of these Taras. There's some wrathful ones, there's some peaceful ones, there's some joyful ones, and we'll just sing their mantras and do the practices and have discussion and you'll learn the melodies that we've been writing, the beautiful melodies for each of the Taras to support people's practice. So this is really like a big part of my life's work and the online course is a way to share that. Um, my book manuscript is due May in May, May 1st of 2022. So in tandem with all that, I'm with the teaching, I'm writing and developing further research. So. And Lojong is always, breathing throughout all of all of that. It's all Dharma. So that starts this Sunday. So that's all I have to say. It's great to be back with you all. And Eve has really carried a lot. And I think we also had Tenzin. I hope that was enjoyable. And I've been looking at our teaching notes. I know they, they've covered quite a bit of ground. And tonight we'll just, we'll keep going. We're nearing the end. There are 59 slogans. Tonight we're on uh, 50 two or three. We might do two tonight, or we might just do one. We'll see how the time goes. Yeah, and Mace is sharing other SFDC events. And of course, uh, come and you're welcome to all of our events here at SFDC. There's so many wonderful things going on. So shall we drop in and meditate? Let's get it into a comfortable position, a position you can hold with relative stillness for 30 minutes or so. Of course, if you wanna lie down, I always encourage people to listen to their body and do what you need to feel comfortable and at ease. Yeah, like snuggle with your teddy bear, like Pamela or whatever that is, a donkey. <laughs> okay, show me that again, you gotta show me that. An elephant, yeah. Ganesh, did you make it? Looks like a Waldorf Ganesh. <laughs> a hand Our hand. aunt made it for us. It's one of my allies. Nice. Uh huh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Jason, it says I'm spotlighted. Mason, we take it away. Why don't you lead tonight? <laughs> I feel shy with you here. I'm sure you'd do great if I was in here, right? Yeah. All right. Hey, maybe everybody should get a chance to lead a meditation. <laughs> All right. So let's find a comfortable seat wherever you are, upright or lying down. The spine is somewhat straight. Of course, a natural S curve is good, but the feeling is a nice, buoyant, uh, aligned spine. Allow the eyes to close. 
This feeling of bowing the chin a little bit to open up the space at the base of the skull helps to also soften the brainstem, the occiput. You can even rock your sacrum forward and back a little bit and feel if there's some communication between your sacrum and your cranium, the craniosacral rhythm. Let's loosen up. Let's loosen up a little bit through the spine. Let's feel the waves. And notice if there's tension. What I usually notice if I start moving the pelvis and I'm like, oh yeah, there's tension in the neck. Maybe the jaw can relax a little bit. Facial muscles. And then rocking and rolling forward back until it feels nice to slowly come to a still point. Feel the bowl of your pelvis nice and balanced, the sits bones square on the, your seat. Or if you're lying down, you can kind of tuck the tailbone and let the sacrum flatten against the floor. Release the low back and let the belly now begin to soften and really open to that nice deep breath. Take a few intentional deep luxurious breaths, releasing tension with the out breath. Feel the shoulders slightly back and down. The chest is buoyant, lifted. And yet don't let the chin jut forward, draw the chin back towards the center of the throat and lengthen the back of the neck. Careful not to grip the belly. Loosen the belt line, metaphorically or literally. legs in a comfortable position, make sure the hips are relaxed, the knees are safe and comfortable, the ankles. In whatever position you're in, make sure you feel aligned and balanced. <clears throat> and bring the tip of the tongue against the upper palate. And then soften the lower molars away from the upper molars. Let the jaw slacken. The eyes can be closed or slightly open, however you wish. And begin by bringing forth your motivation. Why do you practice? Crystallize that internally or out loud, speaking your intention. set this space remembering that in meditation any kind of goal oriented or aim oriented way of thinking is actually counterproductive it's coming back to this the simplicity of being in the moment letting go of thoughts or desires goals projections regret just coming back all we need to do is just be here now again and again with the breath and the body like we're sipping in a elixir of nectar with each inhale offering that to the body the exhales are releasing and letting that elixir circulate throughout the body wherever it needs to go just drinking in each breath Letting the mind 
retire, go on holiday, doesn't need to push or work or achieve. All we do is come back again and again, drink in the breath, receive it, soften more deeply into relaxation. Feel your body like an instrument, like the lute. Within the story of the Buddha of instructing a, a guitar player how to tune his strings, not too tight, not too loose. Just find that middle ground of ease yet wakeful. Always if you're walking a tightrope, not falling off into excitation or laxity, this nice balanced focus, shamatha. Calm abiding, calmly abiding in the moment. If it's helpful to come down into the body, you can spend some time just acknowledging what's here for you, warmth, coolness, tightness, free flow, pulsing, whatever is present, you feel free to ground the mind in the body. Spend some time with the breath, just touching in. And offering the body that nectar of the breath and releasing with the out breath. Simple quality of being, releasing distraction with the out breath. Just being with the breath in the body. And with the quality of warmth within your awareness, suffusing your awareness, the quality of care and love. 
That is your breath. As you drop more deeply into relaxation, to be aware of even the, the more subtle grasping. It's almost like a biological grasping onto what's next. What should I be doing? And just even softly release that. Like a gentle stroke of the breath. Open, like you're cracking open the brainstem into a more deep release like a shell, a clamshell opening, softening the tightness that's bound at the base of the neck. It's bound at the base of the sacrum. And let the mind unravel in the best sense of the word, and unwinding into a deep and profound experience of release and relaxation and open to that inner space. It's beyond center and periphery, this vast open inner space and rest in that. The warmth of the breath envelop you, nourish you, replenish you.
Now with the next phase of our practice, let's uncover any aspects of our body mind that needs some donglen. There's always something there that could use some attention. Maybe there's some you know, pain or tightness or an illness that you've been working through or could be emotional or mental block or challenge. Just feel, regardless of whether it's mental, emotional, feel where it lives in your body. Maybe it's simply physical. And let's consciously direct that loving embrace of the breath to it, like in Tonglen, you breathe in and breathe into what we would normally want to avoid, right? So if there's pain, breathe into the pain. If there's tightness, breathe into the tightness. If there's a void or a dullness or a numbness, breathe into that. Envelop it with the love of your breath and then with the out breath, let it Soften the resistance, the knot, the shell, whatever you find there. Let it crack, unravel, open, release, whatever feels good with the out breath. And just stay with that. Don't distract off. Usually maybe we can take one breath there and then we're off. Let's come back again and again and really envelop it with the love of the breath. Like a warm, fuzzy blanket. Breathing into it, envelop it with the breath and release and open, unravel, unwind with the out breath. Don't get too caught up in a story around it. Just stay with the sensations. Inhaling into it, exhaling, softening and letting it heal itself through the release, the equilibrium, the homeostasis. And trust yourself with that. Trust your body. Release the fear and let the shamatha be that. The breath, breathing into it, releasing with the out breath. You're not even trying to fix it. You're just breathing in the breath, the awareness, the warmth, the love, embrace, and then releasing with the out breath and just letting whatever happens, happen. Discover it, don't push or create, discover, uncover. Let your mind roam to any other areas you'd like to focus on in your own time, or just stay where you are as you wish. You can even put your hand on the area that you're breathing with that helps you stay and focus.
And now if you wish, you can stay with what you're doing or you can open the Tonglen to another or the world. Spend maybe about five more minutes. So let the mind roam. Many of you are experienced Tonglen practitioners now. The idea is that you breathe in that which you would normally not want and that you breathe out that which you would normally want, right? So we're focusing on specific people, loved one, challenging person, or just spend some time with the world, specific groups, countries, regions, as you wish. As the in-breath is drawing it in, transforming it at the heart, and breathing out, a healing, cool wind, clearing, healing, whatever you're focusing on. Release the goal, just being with, allowing and opening to the space. And now we'll conclude by dedicating the merit of our practice for the benefit of others and ourselves. Personal prayer of offering and gratitude. Gratitude to this life, this body, this mind, this intention, this sangha, these teachings and the teachers past and present future.
the earth, the ancestors, Gratitude to those challenging ones in our life, so-called enemies. In Lojong, it said, these are our greatest teachers, even more valuable than the Buddha. And I'll offer the four measurable prayers at closing. May all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings experience immeasurable joy beyond sorrow. And may all beings rest in equanimity beyond attachment and aversion. May it be so. Thank you. So welcome back. I don't know if the video is the right thing. I, I think I just spotlight lit me so Pam and Mace wouldn't be forced to be on the spotlight tonight. Is it working for everybody? Okay. Hmm. It's a nice end to the day, isn't it? To have some time to stay, be with a breath. Any, uh, anybody wanna ask questions or comments, offer comments in the chat or unmute yourself, feel free. You could raise your hand if you wanted to and then we could go hand by hand, you know, down along the lower border of the Zoom is, uh, is um, how do we raise hand? Yeah, reactions and then you can raise your hand and then you'd be lined up along the top. And we could go in order like that. I know you're just dying to share. Hi, Denise. Oh, good, Laura raised her hand. Go ahead, Laura, unmute yourself. Um, this was a, it wasn't entirely related to the Tonglen. It was just a experience I had in this meditation that I hadn't had before that had to do with sound. Okay. And um, I've often found that you know, sudden sounds or whatever irritate me when I'm meditating. Yeah. Um, and I had this kind of interesting experience where I decided that I just didn't care. Nice. <laughs> and strangely enough, it stopped irritating me. I just was like, oh, I don't care, whatever. And it, I, it was just like kind of this interesting thing because this has been bothering me for years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just curious what you think of yeah it's that great a, it's a good sign that's mindfulness that that's definitely a part of the path you're reminding me of the teaching of ajahn Chah. it was i think i talked about his book food for the heart that was very important for me on my retreat earlier in the summer and he talks about sound with his students so it's a great question laura in the sense that it it's common for all of us to be like oh come on you stop it would they just be quiet or oh. but he said to his um, student he's saying to the assembly you know stop going out there and bothering the world with your mind you know like it's actually us who go out to the sound <laughs> and react to it rather than the sound coming into us so stop meddling he said you just said great that's a great way of kind of putting it it's just like yeah, yeah. What, what? Just not going to get involved. Your business. Yeah, don't get involved. Don't go out to it. Yeah. yeah. And in a sense, that seems like what happened naturally to you. Like, I don't care. And then there's a great story of uh, Togo Organ Rinpoche, which I love. And he was this great Dzogchen Mahamudra Rinpoche master, Tibetan. 
and he had some monasteries in Nepal and Tibet. And, well, he had come into exile when the Chinese government invaded. So he was of that generation, real authentic practitioner. And he um, went to visit one of his monasteries. His son, who was also a monk, he has three very well-known sons now, Chokinima Rinpoche, Tsokni Rinpoche, Ningyur Rinpoche, very popular, written lots of books. And, but really, Tolka Urgen, the father, was the Maha Guru. <laughs> and so he went to his monastery. The son took him to his normal quarters, but he said, you know, I'm so sorry, father. There's renovation going on right outside your window, and it's been really loud, you know, like jackhammers and banging. Do you want me to move you to another room? He asked. And Rinpoche said, Oh, no, 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 no. This is good for my practice. Sound, the challenging is good. Sounds are good for my practice. If I can't practice with these sounds, then I have no hope in the bardo. <laughs> The bardo is the intermediary state between one life and the next. And it said that we're going to have all sorts of hallucinatory visions and sounds, roaring, you know, visual, like frightening demons. You know, the key is to stay grounded and see, oh, these are just apparitions. Like, like what Ajahn Chah says, not to go out and grasp them and make them real or get too involved in them. So, yeah, you had a natural in kind of folding in and a centering in where the sounds, no matter what they were, didn't bother you. It only took five years. Right, it only takes, oh yeah, that's fast, yeah. Six, five, six years. Yeah, no rush. Yeah, this stuff takes time. And you'll lose it and it'll come back, but you have that taste now. We talked about that last time I taught. It's like if you, when you taste something for yourself, you know, then you can come back to it. You know what that felt like. Don't let yourself forget that. Remember, that's your teacher. That's your teaching. That's your little slogan. You know, whatever you, it could be. Write it down. Like I don't care. Sound. Ha -ha. <laughs> Jason. I have to unmute. Um, speaking of sound, um, I'm a sound person, which makes me really interested in this discussion, of course, and. I had a really, I just wanted to share, I had a really interesting moment where uh, during the meditation, of course, something happened outside and I can hear everything. So I'm just kind of going like, oh my God, what's going on? I, I heard a bang, bang, like, and a, like a car drove up and then there was this boom box kind of sound. It was the, the sound of a music, very specific beat. And my dog started barking and I was like, usually I'd be so pissed off you know like, oh i'm trying to relax i'm trying to settle in and at this point i was like just let go and i listened and it was like this incredible moment of cacophony resulting in music you know it was just this frame mm -hmm. that i was able to experience and i was i was drawn out of the meditation which is one thing that kind of pissed me off at first mm -hmm. and i was like well i'm just gonna listen and the listening was really cool it was like i got into this whole thing it was like this little music composition happened and then it ended. It ended perfectly within the frame of everything. And actually it timed with what you were, you reintroduced us back to kind of come back in right at a moment when it was over. So I was kind of like, wow, that was awesome. And it reminded me of being in 23rd Street, um, 20, you know, and yeah. Folsom, Folsom, where it used to happen all the time. We'd be meditating oh, yeah. and be like crazy yeah. people yelling and screaming and like, <laughs> you know, and stuff banging around upstairs. And there would be ripples of laughter kind of running through the so i just had this moment i just wanted to share that 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 sound does that for me often where i'm just it frames up perfectly as a piece of music yeah and sometimes unbidden i don't i want to reject it and then if i just let it flow mm -hmm. it becomes very kind of like interesting and cool so just wanted to share that you're in the Tao, you know, you're not resisting, you're not creating. When you're in the Tao and you're in that mindful, open, allowing, just letting go space, it's like the magic happens, or at least we can notice the magic happening. <laughs> the magic is happening all the time. <laughs> it is, right? And but when we meditate and we open and we, we learn how to be more Zen, you know, life we get to witness this magic and enjoy our life in a much more rich juicy creative way joyful way um, 
mysterious way. That's beautiful. Yeah, sound is one of the the sensory impressions that come in through the sense doors, right? The ears are a sense door. And people, I mean, the Buddha taught and sound meditation is a very important aspect of the practice, whether it's a bell or even just opening to all sound. Thich Nhat Hanh would say, you know, we I did a couple family retreats with him back in the early 2000s. And he would say, oh, let the children just 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 observe the children screaming and laughing outside while we're trying to meditate just just observe them or hear them as chirping birds they're just the birds chirping you don't react to the birds chirping do you oh birds shut up you know <laughs> i wish they would be quiet and i just love that it, it was an allowance for me to just be and be with my own experience but also to allow them to be children. So I've always felt very um, also enamored with and um, grateful for sound meditation. Diane. Thank you. This is so synchronistic. Um, this same thing came up for me last week. And I thought, gosh, I wish I could, I had a teacher to talk to about this. And here we are. Um, I'm fine with ambient sound, you know, childish glee, backfiring. Um, I live in an urban area, but when I'm, but I, I'm, when there's a guided meditation and I'm resting in the spaciousness of being or, you know, full body awareness. And then I hear someone say, and then rest in the full body, you know, and I get the kind of the prompts, the prop prompts that you do do. I find it really distracting. Yeah. So my thought was, well, you know, this is the practice. So let me, let me meditate, you know, let me get uh, focus on my center and full body awareness and let it be and all these good things, but it's still, so I turn the sound really down and then it's fine. Like, well, you know, mm. just turn it off. You're creating yeah. this, you're creating this um, mm -hmm. for yourself. I'm clear on that, but I just thought, so then anyway, tonight people are talking about the sound and this is the very thing that comes up for me during guided meditations. And so I thought, well, maybe if I say something, it will, I'll, I can unbother myself in the future. Yeah. You're just reminding me of me, like, I've had teachers where I have loved every little utterance they would give. It always felt like the right timing. And then some of my teachers, I just be like, can't they just be quiet? <laughs> can we just sit? Well, it's not the teachers, the guided me meditation. You know? It's the guided the meditation. <laughs> They're like saying, rest in the spaciousness. I'm resting in the spacious. And then it's like, oh. That's... Then the mind comments on it. Yeah, you just, you know, you even just speaking that out loud, now you know yourself a bit better now. You know, you've voiced it. And um, you just it's just like another thought, right? It's just another practice. Like, oh, yeah, there I go, gripping onto that again or reacting to it or not wanting it. or Oh, just a thought. Let it go. Another you know, the great master Jigme Lingpa from the 17th century, 18th century, said, you know, all from Tibet, thoughts are like uh, logs on the blazing fire of your awareness. So you could, Diane, you know, I can tell you're, you're, you've got some savoir faire with meditation. You're like, offer those thoughts to the fire of your awareness and it lets the awareness blaze forth even stronger. That's alchemy, that's tantra. That's, that's taking life as path, right? Thoughts as path, the mind is path. Throw those thought logs on the fire and let your awareness blaze forth even more. Why do you have it? Thank you for that. Yeah, that's a great quote. Haha, -ha, I have it. I have it. I have it right here. I'm going to read you the quote from Jigme Lingpa. In the beginning, meditative awareness is like a small flame, which can easily be extinguished and needs to be protected and nurtured. Later, it is more like a huge bonfire, which consumes whatever falls into it. Then the more thoughts that arise, the more awareness blazes up 
like adding logs to a bonfire. Imaho, which means like, how wonderful. Everything is food for naked, enlightened awareness. Dzogchen Master Jingme Lingpa. Yeah, I mean, you could, this is just, this is all we need. <laughs> But I wanted to share, I have some other things in here that I wanted to share that relate to this slogan, but I just also wanted to share the cover. This is a teacher training manual that I made in 2009 and my daughter, who was nine at the time, made this collage for the cover of my teacher training manual. I was teaching shamatha and vipassana, quiescence and insight meditation teacher. It was a module in a yoga teacher training. It's very ambitious of me. Just did it a couple of times. I'm like, no, forget it. <laughs> you guys, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this in a weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's too much. But I've got some really great nuggets in here that I want to share with you, including that poem. So if there aren't any more questions, let's dig into the slogan and then I'll read from my booklet here. Does that sound good? Okay, let's find the slogan. We are. Uh, today we are at slogan 53, don't vacillate <laughs> or don't be sporadic. Rejok mija, it's very short in Tibetan. Rejok mija, rejok means to move back and forth. Mija means don't do it. Don't oscillate, don't vacillate. So of course we can guess what this means. This is be consistent with your practice as much even if it's three minutes a day at least that's consistency remember my quote is frequency well i know some people we, i don't want to use the word trump but the, the original quote is frequency trumps duration <laughs> my friends like could you not use the word trump? okay frequency um is better than duration so even just a little bit every day is that nice consistent practice they say in the Dharma that inconsistency undermines our self-confidence and prevents us from making progress. And I, I mean, I admittedly, I know I've been consistent. I've been inconsistent. I think a lot of us know that consistency is nice within reason. You don't want to get too tight with it. So the point is when we're doing mind training, which is lojong, right? Training the mind saturating it it's like we're dyeing it in a beautiful dye we're we're fabric and lojo mind training is the the dye and if we're sporadic with it or we only dip it in a little bit right we're not going to absorb it in the same way so like we we need to not check out but actually see that there's actual no vacation from working with our mind because we're always with it whether we like it or not so as much as you can continually contemplate, where is some, where's my mind right now? Oh, am I stuck in negative thought patterns? How can I shift that? What can I bring to this moment? Can I breathe? Can I do a little self tonglen, tonglen for others? Oh, am I in my self grasping fear mode? Oh yes, I remember, you know, Lo Jong is about, um, you know, self love, of course, but also loving others and releasing self grasping and opening to care for others and so on. So there's no real holiday from mind training when you're really taking it seriously. And the beautiful thing about mind training is that it doesn't really re require any bells and whistles, anything external. It doesn't even really require a meditation cushion, right? All we really need is our mind. And we always have that. And so in terms of like not vacillating and how do I have a consistent practice, it's a question that people always ask. It's, it's definitely not an easy thing to do. I thought of this wonderful article that I had put in this teacher training manual. Um, it's not a long article. It's just a list of ways that we can cultivate um, a more consistent and satisfying practice. It's written by a wonderful Zen teacher. Maybe some of you know her. She's written some great books too. Her name is... Charlotte, jo Char Charlotte Joko Beck. Charlotte Joko Beck. And it's called On Meditation Practice. It was in the Shambhala Sun in 2002. It's an old article. It's 
So I want to read some of these to you because they were very helpful for me in my practice. She says, don't begin a sitting period without considering why you meditate. We do that. We arouse our motivation. Know your intention. Know that there is nowhere to go, nothing to achieve, and be aware of ambitious thoughts. Check your posture. No matter how you sit, the body should be erect, but not stiff. Balanced and at ease. The sitting place should be neat and pleasant. But we can sit anywhere and in any position, even lying down if ill or exhausted. I find that if I tidy up my meditation space um, or light a candle and light a candle and some incense, sometimes I sweep if it's the, an area that needs to be swept and cleaned, then I feel more um, ready to practice. So even taking a few minutes to tidy up before you practice can be very satisfying and, and makes you happy. Thank you. I see that Mace shared the article in the chat. Now, here's what she says, sit every day. Try not to miss more than one day in a week. And this is true, because if you miss more than one, then you kind of descend down the slippery slope of losing your commitment, losing your regularity. If you miss one day, it's okay. But try not to miss more than one day. If resistance arises, it is a normal part of practice. Be aware that it consists of thinking, like all thought, it need not dominate you. Just observe it, feel it in the body, and do not bully yourself ever. Then she says, once a week, sit 10 to 15 minutes longer than you want to sit. And don't become obsessed by sitting. In no case should one's work or family responsibilities be neglected in order to sit. This one's hard. She says, when upset, don't avoid sitting. Hard as it may be, it is crucial to sit when difficulties arise. It's easy to say, oh, I'm too upset to sit. But that's just when we should be practicing. Know that sitting is simply maintaining awareness of body and mind. Be aware of any desire to turn sitting into an escape from life by entering peaceful trance-like states. Such states can be seductive, but they are of no use. So being with what's here, not escaping from what's here. Be aware of the honeymoon period for new sitters is often followed by resistance, possible turbulence and emotional uprisings. Just continue practice with particular emphasis on feeling your body sensations. So coming back to the body, coming home to the body. Uh, one of my mantras these days is listen to my body, learning to listen to my body cues is a beautiful way to drop out of the dominant, dominating head story of what we should be doing. Listen to the signals of the body, breathe with the body, like what we did tonight, I think you'll find that you'll want to practice more because you're nourishing yourself and you're attending to yourself. She says, be aware that achieving something in sitting, such as special clarity, insight, calmness of mind, is not the point. These may occur, but the point is your awareness of whatever is happening, including confusion, discouragement, or anxiety. Keep your practice to yourself. Don't attempt to teach others. Do not proselytize. Leave your friends and family alone. There's an old saying, let them ask three times. What you can give others is how you live. Don't spend your time, uh, don't spend your sitting time in planning. Nothing is wrong with planning per se, but set up another time for it. If you hear planning thoughts when you sit, label them planning. 
in daily life be acutely aware of the desire to gossip or complain to judge others or yourself to feel superior or inferior all practice can be summed up as one observation of the mental process and two the experiencing of present bodily sensations no more no less and finally, remember that real practice is not about the techniques or koans or anything else, slogans you could say, as ends in and of themselves, but about the transformation of your life and ours. There are no quick fixes. Our practice is about our life and we practice forever. So Charlotte Jokobek is a Dharma heir of the late Maizumi Roshi and founder of the Ordinary Mind Zen School. I think she used, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know if she's still there, but was in the South Bay. Has anybody studied with her? I, if you're curious, I recommend seeking out some of her books. I, I can't remember what they're called now. It was a long time ago I read her stuff, but she has some very wonderful, short, inspiring books. helpful, isn't it? You find that helpful? Yeah, some tips in there. Yeah. It's not easy. Definitely for me, over the years, the consistency has been one of the big teachers. And um, self love through it all patience, acceptance is also very important. It's important not to get tight with it. I would like to go to the next slogan because they're connected. They're kind of like two little bites tonight. So that will make one big bite. Slogan number 54, train wholeheartedly. Simple, right? Dolce du jong. So it's jong is to train like lo jong, lo jong, lo jong, two variations of the same verb to train or to purify jong. Uh, dolce du means to do it fully, you know, wholeheartedly. So the classical commentary here is that really, unless you're you're fully committed to mind training, you're not really going to release your self grasping. You have to really like, not just do it when it's easy, right? But do it wholeheartedly, even when the going gets tough. So make that commitment, you know if you want to, and to practice regularly in these ways that we talked about just now. Dogo Kyansei Rinpoche said, it's important to practice, but first you need to learn how to practice, right? So really taking the time to read, study, test things out, and then drop in. When you found your home ground, then dig in and go deep with it. So now I want to read from another piece in here that, uh, that I wrote. It's called The Power of Intention, A Handful of Dust. Um, it's about practice and wholehearted, pra like wholehearted practice. It's also about intention. Uh, I won't read the whole thing maybe, but I'll read from parts of it. I start the article with the quote, what makes an action good or bad? This is the Buddha speaking. Not how it looks, nor whether it is a big or small, but the good or evil motivation behind it. So I'll read this like a story. This is a story. In Tibetan lore, there is a well-known and well-loved character named Geshe Ben, a foolish monk whose anecdotes teach us much about the foibles that befall us along the spiritual path. One such story applies to the importance of checking our motivation carefully, even when engaging in seemingly positive actions. One day, Geshe Ben was expecting a visit from his patrons. That Geshe means teacher, and it's usually, it's always a monk, right? So he's a Geshe Ben. So he's got the title, 
but he's kind of like a clown. He's a lot of stories about him are quite funny. So one day, Geshe Ben was expecting a visit from his patrons. And that morning, he made a special effort to tidy up his shrine more beautifully than usual by making special offerings. You know, fresh water, maybe some fresh flowers, some candles, cleaning it up and making it beautiful. Examining his intentions, he saw that they were motivated out of desire to impress his patrons. So he immediately picked up a handful of dust and threw it all over the shrine saying, monk, just stay where you are and don't put on airs. <laughs> Later, when the great teacher Padampa Sangye heard this story, he said, that handful of dust Geshe Ben threw on his shrine is the best offering in all of Tibet. Just love that story. That's the best offering. So what the story illustrates is the importance of introspection, of watching ourselves, of always practicing, right? Always watching the mind. Why are we doing things? Are we showing off? Are we trying to impress? Are we exaggerating because we don't feel like we're good enough? I think I talked about that last time in terms of speech, right? Not lying. And do we lie because we're we feel like uh, we're not okay as we are. You know, watch the mind always. And then grab up that piece of dust if you find yourself trying to be something you're not. Throw it on. <laughs> throw it on your shrine. Throw it on whatever metaphor. If our intention is good, then act on it, right? Okay, I've got, I'm, I'm not trying to show off. I'm actually, you know, being grounded, clear, good intention to be a benefit here. Okay, then go for it, act. But if our intention is based on ambition or greed, then we should work to change it and infuse it with bodhicitta, bodhicitta, the heartfelt motivation to benefit self and others, right? So, okay, so how can I change this? How can I, what do I need to shift to get more in line with the Lojong teachings of bodhicitta? So, yeah, there's, there's more here. I could share the article if people wanted it. Yeah, I go on and talk all about practice and stuff like that, but I thought it would be fun to open it up to you. Also, in terms of your reflections and questions, do you have any stories like that? Or what does this story mean to you? Uh, why, why would this be the best offering in all of Tibet? Or anything else that I've said? from either of the two slogans. Feel free to raise your hand. Or I could read more from the article. There's more here, but you can tell me what you want. So, you know, Charlotte Joko Beck was talking specifically about consistent practice, right? And of course, it's difficult to have the post meditative state if we don't have a meditative state. So we need to sit. It's called AOC, and it's not a senator from the, from the Bronx. It's ass on cushion. We need to do ass on cushion, right? But we also need to be like Geshe Ben and watch our mind even when we're tidying up the house or getting ready for something or doing our work. So practice is always happening, not just AOC. Well, I have a question. Mm -hmm. One keeps starting off the questions, but um, the thing about intention, mm -hmm. You know, there's an old saying, I'm sure you know it, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Oh. And I've always, um, you, you've never heard that saying. Yeah, I, mean, I have. I, I, right. And I, when I when I hear, you know, what matters most is our intention. Mm. There must be more nuance to this than I'm fully understanding. Okay, good, good. 
Yeah, my sense is that that quote is coming at it from a different angle. Like, okay, if you just if things just remain intentions and we don't get active with them, if we just want the world to be a better place, but we don't really do anything to help it, that's maybe what they're talking about. There's not going to be a lot of great outcome, and actually things can get worse, right? That, that's kind of how I would some interpret of it, that. or also the law of unintended consequences. You can sometimes feel that what you're doing is good, but it turns out that you know. Mm. Uh, you thought you were helping somebody, but as it turns out, it made the situation mm -hmm. worse. Yeah, it doesn't mean you were badly intended. Um, that's why I've always I've kind of struggled with this this idea of it's the intentions that matter most. Okay, good. So let me help you, and I think we can find a middle ground with this because I think both angles are definitely um, pertinent and important. But. Um, you know, this comes from the Buddha's teachings on the mind being uh, the foremost important thing to watch and to train, right? Because from thoughts give rise to actions and speech, right? Those things come from, it's like the source of the, of the well or the spring is the mind. So if the mind is stuck in negativity, then the speech will reflect that and actions will reflect that. Whereas if the mind has positive states and benevolent, you know, feelings and intentions, then the, the speech and the, the physical actions will follow, body, speech, and mind. So there's an old saying, between the three of body, speech, and mind, decipher what is the most of, utmost important. And in Buddhism, they'd say the mind, because the mind gives rise to perception, the mind gives rise to action and voice and speech. It doesn't mean that the other things aren't important. The other reason why they say the mind is important is because it's what goes from one life to the next. If you believe in reincarnation, you know, you don't even have to believe in reincarnation to meditate or to feel benefit from these teachings, but um, it's not the material body that we take. So the body's not the most important. It's not the speech, the voice, because we can't take the speech with us into the next life, but it's the consciousness and the karmic imprints that we've uh, cultivated within our substrate consciousness, it's called, that is what goes from one life to the next. So then we should cultivate the mind and really work on purifying and cultivating a positive, intelligent, wise, compassionate mind. So when Buddhists say arouse your intention or the intentions are the most important thing, um, that's also a fate, something that really became prominent in the Mahayana era. In the earlier teachings, it was more important to like follow the rules. Of course, the intention was always important. Um, but in terms of the monastic order, the, the Vinaya, the vows were very important. So you had to follow the rules. There was a pushback on that kind of right and wrong, uh, rigid, way of being that had developed since obviously the Buddha died hundreds of years earlier, it had kind of gotten rigid with hundreds of vows and rules. So by the turn of the millennium around 100 CE, the Mahayana, the great vehicle phase of Buddhism arose in India. And a part of that was a shift away from rules towards what is your motivation behind the rules. So the motivation for any action or, or um, speech was more important than just following a rule, right? So you could, that gave more freedom to break the rules if it was for the benefit of yourself or others. So it gave more freedom and uh, was more forgiving and probably more livable. So that's also what they're talking about, especially What's interesting is this, even these earlier teachings like Theravada and Vipassana traditions absorbed a lot of tendencies of the Mahayana. So even though they don't call themselves Mahayana, they actually sound very Mahayana. Like when you listen or read Ajahn Chah, you're like, oh, he's totally Mahayana. <laughs> you know, there's not such clear delineations. But um, yeah, I mean, what is the quote? I, I should have this memorized. The very first passage in the Dhammapada, the words of the Buddha, is like the mind is the lead, you know, the, the, everything else follows the mind. And so that's why our intention, where are we coming from and what are we wanting is important. So probably just that helps. That helps. Yeah, that helps. Yeah. 
I, I think I'm, I'm beginning to understand it better. It's like if you, you get angry at someone, but your intention is to wake them up out of their stupor, right? Like sometimes I have to do that with my 13 year old. Like I'm getting angry because <laughs> you're not hearing me. You know, my intention is coming from love, but it sounds fierce, you know? And I've done the opposite. I've yelled out of anger and wanting to like shake, you know, break it, break up, break, break something. <laughs> Yeah, I've done that too, you know, and that doesn't feel as good. But if I can do it with this love intention, like you're gonna wake up here because I love you and I can't let you grow up like that, you know, that's a loving intention. That's a good intention that might not look so great on the outside, but they feel it, you know, the kids feel it. He responds well to that. He's actually, thanks mom, I'm sorry. You know, he gets it. So people feel our intentions too, don't they? Usually, not always, but. Yeah, good questions, Laura. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. The chats. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. I think Michael has a question, Chandra. Okay. Oh, Am I right, Michael? Yeah, it's sort of a, a question or a comment. I was thinking yeah. that, that whole issue about intention um, and going back to those comments about the importance of regularity of practice. Mm -hmm. um, to me, in my experience, the one of the benefits of regularity of practice is that I get better at recognizing where my where I'm coming from um, yeah. and so with that clarity that's where I really get the idea of the importance of intention but if I'm not clear you know I can think that um, my intention is pretty good but I can yeah there's a, I have a fair ability to calm myself um, so that that I, I do get that importance of the intention but it's the the importance of being clear about where I'm coming from that seems so important to me. Good, yes. I agree. That's why the practice is the AOC is so important because it gives us that clarity so that we know ourselves better, know thyself, right? And that's it's kind of like the goal, the non-goal goal of this, but these endeavors, spiritual life, no matter what tradition you're in, is to know thyself. Because nobody like you, Michael, nobody like you, Laura, Diane, Denise, nobody like you. Everybody, you get to know yourself in this life. What a beautiful thing. And we'll go through different chapters in our life, right? And discovering new aspects of ourselves as we get older and change. So yeah, the, the, it's so nice when we have that daily practice. Or I, don't, I don't need to say daily, I can say consistent practice. You might be three times a week or it might be twice daily, who knows, but consistent practice that's nourishing for us, helps us know ourselves and have that clarity so that we can do less harm right and live in more integrity and cultivate that inner joy that really meditation is better than any drug <laughs> in my opinion I, don't, I, mean, I haven't taken every drug <laughs> but drugs have side effects so meditation has positive side effects like my mom my mom was my first teacher she's always like let's get happy you know meditation helps us get happy Don't have to pop a pill. I mean, sometimes we have to pop pills. I know I have close family members who need to be on medication to help certain things. So I'm not belittling that, but enhancing it with meditation. I was addicted to cigarettes in my early 20s. I thought I was a cool art student. I was smoking a, cig a pack of cigarette a day, of cigarettes a day. <laughs> Idiot. What was I thinking? 
But what helped me get out of that was replacing that addiction with getting addicted to meditation and yoga, learning to breathe again. Like, oh my God, I have to breathe. Um, sometimes we need to get hooked on the good stuff. And to be around people who are into that, you know, like us. People who support that. That's the importance of the Sangha. Oh, Genevieve has a question. Hi, Genevieve. About how to distinguish or play with the difference between accepting annoyances like noises or annoying people versus a freeze response like from stress. Yeah. Well, I'm not a psychologist, but uh, probably feels better, right? It feels better, like what Laura described is this moment of release, of not caring, but in a good way. Whereas frozen, frozen isn't necessarily my go-to. It's my best friend freezes and talks about it quite a bit. And so I'm familiar with the, the frozen, but more from an observer. And um, the way she describes it is a kind of a stiffness and an incapacity to really kind of move, right? Whereas when you're, when you're able to be with the annoyances, there's a fluidity there. You're still, you're not uh, cut off from your power source. You're still very alive, you know, you're still very feeling. It's not like you're going numb. And it's more ple pleasurable. Now, maybe freezing feels good when it's been a coping mechanism, but it, it's a bit more of a, like the word implies, like a stiffness to it. But may, I'm open to other comments here with this. You don't want to roll over and play dead. It's, it's called like stupid mindfulness or stupid idiot compassion, idiot mindfulness. You know, you don't want to become a vegetable, not not respond to the world you know really as we deeply deepen our practice we become more you know involved in a way but not involved <laughs> we're not going out and meddling involved but we're feeling we're alive to the world okay good geneva mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to address the um, freezing in yeah. the, you know, fight or flight. I, yeah. I, I freeze. Okay. That's my, where I go. And it's, it's not so much frozen as it's completely numb. numb. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not anxiety. It's just mm -hmm. shut down. I can't think. I can't be rational. I can't be angry. I'm just sh completely shut down not reacting, not, um, I, I can't talk, I can't, but it's not anxiety. It's not from being afraid of something. It's just like turn off. Yeah. It's just a switch that flips. That's, and it takes however long it takes to start working again. Mm -hmm. It can be days, it can be an hour. You just don't know. But the freeze, you know, it's just a total numbness for me. Mm. Physically, I don't want to walk. I don't want to exercise. I don't want to think. I don't want to watch yeah. TV. I don't want to. It's just, it all shuts down. Then I have to kind of be patient with it mm -hmm. so that I can bubble up again. Yeah. To, to be there. If I get frustrated or angry with it, it just takes longer. So I just have to let it be and let myself return in my own speed, mm -hmm. so to speak. Thank you. Yeah, good. I'm glad you shared that. You know what you're reminding me of is it's so beautiful. You know, I don't know if you're familiar in, in Buddhism, there's the mandala structure, right? We have the, the center and the four quadrants, and it's like a medicine wheel. You know, it's a similar pattern throughout many religious traditions around the world. 
And this each quadrant, each either center or the four directions has symbolic meaning. And they're called the Buddha families. So there's the center Buddha family, there's the Eastern, the Southern, the Western and the Northern. And um, it's like a psychic template or a template for the psyche to meditate upon and to, and to um, work within. And the central position is the Buddha family. And the Buddha family uh, center is, its encumbered pattern is like the freeze. It's a dull, it's not dull, but it's like a numbness, a dis dissociatedness. Um, also in Buddhist parlance, it's the marikva, the ignorance, uh, not knowing. It's a not knowingness, so not really there. And the when that encumbered pattern is transformed and healed, purified, you could say, into its essence, it manifests as the wisdom of dharmata, which means suchness. And that is the capacity to be with, to be with everything. It's like the all, and sometimes it's translated as all encompassing wisdom. And in a sense, it's like what we were talking about earlier with the sound, you know, I mean, you can just be with, but not react to it, like what Laura was talking about. Or what uh, Ajahn Shah says is, you know, you're not going out and getting enmeshed in all the sounds, but you can hear it, you can be with it. You can be with the suchness of all reality, but without being caught up in it, and you're awake to it. So I feel like this is coming up in this conversation around sound, around freezing versus accepting annoyances is kind of a, maybe more of what Genevieve was touching in is this kind of like accepting annoyances or being more of a passive bystander or numb to things versus really, oh no, the accepting was the good thing, right? So the, that would be accepting annoyances like sounds would be the wisdom of suchness, the wisdom of dharma. Dharma is reality or phenomena the ta at the end is ness. So the, the, the dharma ness of things, the truth ness, or the phenomenon ness of things, maybe phenomenology, the qualia of things. <laughs> so being able to be with without uh, checking out and going dull is that wisdom aspect of the center of the Buddha. If we had more time, I'd tell you the other four quadrants, but we're at time now. <laughs> Maybe next time. Yeah, good. Well, thank you, everyone. Great to be here with you. And hopefully this will inspire you in certain ways to forge your own path and cultivate the wisdom of suchness within your life. Let's take a moment to in your own way, offer up the deliciousness, the goodness of our time together for the benefit of the world. So much need, so much out there and in here that can benefit from love and wisdom. Offer that. And then even if it's just a simple, may all beings experience this joy that I'm feeling now, or this peace that I'm feeling now, just offer whatever bliss, whatever joy, whatever goodness you feel, even if it's small, train up and the next response is, may all beings experience this in some way. That's Lojong right there. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you. If you can offer Thank Donna, you. the SFDC is ever grateful. And the links are there and you can subscribe to the newsletter. That's how you can stay abreast of classes and any updates we might send. And of course, you can watch past videos on our YouTube, YouTube channel, SF Dharma Collective on YouTube, you'll see all sorts of good stuff there. Thank you, Mason, Pamela. Take care. Thanks, Jason. Everybody else helps to make this happen. Ciao, ciao.
，拜拜。